The first panel is on choice and regulation in financial markets. Um, and uh, we thought that this is a particularly uh, suitable topic for our um, conference because, uh, or for several reasons. One is that it's fair to say, I think, that behavioral studies actually started um, in this area uh, under the name of behavioral finance that is, has a long, quite long tradition, uh, maybe longer than in other areas uh, of behavior. Uh, that is one element or one reason why it may be uh, warranted to take a closer look. Another one may be that it is a particularly suitable field for paternalism because um, it is fair to assume that the investors, all of them basically, are interested in one thing, namely maximizing the return of, on their investment. Nobody wants to lose money. Everybody wants the same. It's like a homogenous good. And as we all know uh, and can witness time and again, um, this goal is not always achieved, to say the least. So um, there is a lot, seems to be a lot of room uh, for improvement. And the third element, or the third reason why it may be a good idea to look at this topic is that the obvious solution that has been followed by lawmakers, I think, everywhere for decades, namely to improve the information of the investor, the, the, the information that's available to him by forcing disclosure upon other market participants or intermediaries, that this policy ha has obvious limitations and is not, has not led to the, to the uh, successes that were envisaged when they were implemented. So most people are still far from being financially, financially literate. And uh, it has been questioned yesterday, I think, or, already, whether this is at all a reasonable goal to try to educate the population at large so that it can really uh, um, make rational Pro, almost professional investment decisions. So for these reasons, I think it's a good idea that we now talk about this topic. And our first uh, speaker is Oren Bargill from Harvard University, who is focusing on some of these more modern aspects of behavioral finance and tries to draw policy conclusions from them. Uh, thank you, Gerhard. Um, Gerhard told us that we can actually stand in terms of social norms and stigma, so I'll, I'm going to do that. Um, so the, kind of, the title for my, remar my remarks this afternoon is uh, Information and Paternalism, but I am going to draw and use examples from the kind of consumer financial markets. So I'm not going to talk too much, and my examples are not going to come from the areas of investment, but more from the areas of borrowing. So this is another kind of aspect of consumer uh, finance. And so what I want to start with is a perception that at least I have, and I've been hearing a little bit of this over the last couple of days, that in terms of regulation and regulatory techniques and tools that we have, disclosure is fine. It's the least objectionable of all, it's the least paternalistic of all regulatory techniques. It enhances both efficiency, and autonomy, and I'm kind of um, I'm quoting from Cass's lecture yesterday, and it's not humiliating or disrespectful in terms of you know, the other uh, concerns or ethical concerns that we might have. And so when people think about various responses to a market failure, if traditional market failures or behavioral market failures, oftentimes disclosure is considered to be the easiest, both practically, politically, and normatively, as attractive solution. And I want to challenge this perception challenge this conventional wisdom on, on two counts. Many of these things have come up, or these themes have come up over the last couple of days, but I just want to put some focus on them, um, and make them maybe more salient, and frame them differently. So the first challenge is that behaviorally informed disclosure regulation is, is not only about information provision in the traditional sense. Okay, so when we were thinking, when we were thinking traditionally about disclosure as just you know, provide people with information so they can make better choices, then really it is not controversial. But I want to argue that this behaviorally informed disclosure regulation, this new paradigm of disclosure is not about that, or at least not only about that, and this might raise some ethical questions. 
The other challenge, and these are not kind of mutually exclusive, they're related. Um, the second challenge is that effective disclosure is necessarily selected. And so the point here, and this relates to um, you know, Cass's point about time or information overload or kind of attention budgets that we might have, because of all these constraints, we cannot just assume that we can give people whatever information we want and they will be able to understand it, digest it and use it. We have to be selective in what we choose to disclose if we want disclosure to be effective. And once we focus on this element of selection, then we need to understand again that there is a very important role for government who is doing the selecting, what information is being disclosed and what is not. So I'm going to start with kind of the first challenge, elaborate on it a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to call this beyond information provision. So I'm thinking now about disclosures under this new paradigm, this behaviorally informed disclosure that is more than just providing people with information so they can make better decisions. And the first an argument here is that, as we know, disclosure has to do with framing, whether we want it or whether we don't want it. Okay? And so it turns out that when we take framing seriously, as we should, that it matters not only what we tell people in terms of the content of information, it also matters how we tell it. Sometimes the how is even more important in terms of effects on behavior than what we actually say. And so one example, I promised to give you an example from the consumer finance context. So one example is, say, look at mortgage regulation in the United States, kind of mortgages more generally. <clears throat> in the United States, you know that the question of refinancing your mortgage is really important. I know this is not the case in most European countries. It's maybe in Denmark, maybe an exception. The question is usually many people, when they take a mortgage, they take a mortgage for 30 years and then they refinance it. In fact, it is exceedingly rare for anybody to stay with their mortgage for the full 30 years. Almost never happens. So the question of refinance and the option to refinance is a major value component when you're looking at different mortgage products and you're trying to compare among them. And so one question is, and there are proposals along these lines, is whether we need to disclose or require lenders to disclose information about this repayment option, this refinancing option. And we can think about different ways to do that. And framing here, it turns out, uh, will matter quite a bit. So you can think about a frame that takes on kind of a positive frame, disclose the probability and consequences of getting an attractive refinance option, maybe two years down the road, five years down the road. Or you can think about a negative frame, talk about the probability and consequences of not being able to refinance. And this is something that was very um, important and troubling for many people during the financial crisis, the mortgage crisis. They thought that they would be able to refinance into better mortgages, but then they couldn't. Okay, so framing is an important uh, dimension of disclosure and something that regulators can influence and should think about. The second, perhaps, more important kind of qualification or challenge under this title of beyond just information provision is something that we've touched upon and Professor Sunstein touched upon. It's the invocation of system one in our disclosures, or having disclosure regulation that invokes the kind of intuitive, emotional, effective system one rather than the deliberative system two in our decision-making processes. So when we traditionally think about disclosure, under the conventional paradigm, we think about disclosure under a system two perspective. This is disclosure that's going to help us deliberate better and make better choices. But we see that disclosure can also target uh, system one. One example that was mentioned is graphic warnings on cigarette labels. Okay, so the idea here, we want to scare people um, away from smoking. It's an emotional response that we're looking to attain, not a deliberative information uh, processing response necessarily. We can think again, going back to the mortgage example, we can think about similar type of disclosures and warnings with respect to mortgages. Again, so there are devastating stories of foreclosure, and student, you know, including graphic depictions that have happened during the kind of mortgage crisis. You know, we can put those in our disclosure warnings rather than then providing dry information. And so to summarize this beyond information provisions challenge, this is my kind of challenge number one, I want to again finish by comparing the conventional and the new paradigms of disclosure. 
Conventional disclosure paradigm is information is providing the disclosure provides information for rational decision makers so that they can make better choices, they can arrive at better outcomes. The behaviorally informed disclosure is different. It severs or at least loosens the link, okay, the rational deliberation link between the disclosure and the outcome and the behavior, and it suggests alternative channels mediated through bias. And emotion, and so when we move from the conventional to the behaviorally informed disclosure paradigms, we see that there is more room for scrutiny of even disclosure mandates. The second challenge that I mentioned has to do with selective disclosure. In many contexts, in many decisions that we need to make, and in many decisions in which regulators want to intervene with disclosure regulation, the decisions themselves are complex. Often exceedingly so, and this is in particular true when we're talking about consumer finance, okay, choosing the right mortgage, credit card, what type of loan to take.、Um, the amount of information is staggering, and when the amount of information is staggering, it is impossible. Just as a matter of you know being human, it's impossible for us to process all the relevant information. And when it is impo- impossible for us to process all the relevant information, there has to be a selection. When we're talking about disclosure regulation, the government agency who is designing the disclosure has to select what information will be disclosed and what information will not be disclosed, or at the very least, they need to select what information is going to be prominently disclosed versus less prominently disclosed. And this selection affects outcomes. And can affect outcomes in very substantial and meaningful ways, and therefore it deserves the proper scrutiny. One example that we've heard about for the past couple of days is、uh, calorie disclosures. And already yesterday, Cask was asked, "So why disclose calories? Why not disclose something else? Why not disclose, say, trans fats? Although there's recent research, maybe that's relevant to disclose. I don't know. But there are many other dimensions relating to food intake." Into the type of foods that we eat and the ingredients in these foods that are relevant for our health. Why should we focus on calories versus something else? This is a selection. It's a decision that was made by the regulator to focus on this dimension rather than some other dimension to make this decision salient, rather than make some other decision salient in our decision-making、uh, process. Now, it might well be the right decision, but it is a decision that has important implications for behavior and therefore deserves scrutiny. The second example that I want to give is the example of the APR disclosure in consumer finance. And so the idea behind the APR disclosure is that because consumer finance is so complicated, because there are so many different dimensions of cost and price associated with a mortgage or a credit card, it is impossible, and we do not think that the average consumer or borrower would be able to look at all these different dimensions and figure out what the total cost is. And so the idea is that we want to force the lender, the seller of these consumer financial products, to do the aggregating for the consumer and disclose it in the form of an APR. And this is a very kind of admirable goal. It's、um, something that we should still focus on and think about. But it's also important to understand that it is not obviously clear what cost of credit means, what the total cost of credit means, and there are very big debates in the U.S. and I imagine outside of the U.S. of What exactly is the cost of credit? What fees are in? What fees are out? What prices are in? What prices are out? How should we aggregate different prices and fees that are spread out across time? How do we do this intertemporal aggregation?、Okay, so Gerhard said it's all about money, but money can be spread out. It takes different forms with different probabilities under different contingencies in different times. And so even when we're talking about money, there are interesting and important questions. It is you know mul- money here is multidimensional. Another question: Should we, in the disclosure regulation, in the APR, should we include the prepayment option, the option to prepay early, okay, refinance the mortgage? Should we calculate that? Currently, in the U.S., the APR is based on the assumption that you're going to stay with your mortgage for 30 years, but nobody does. It's a completely false assumption. Should we change that assumption and calculate a different APR? The same could be said about the default option. Okay, I can decide to default on my mortgage. Not to pay anymore. Okay, so they might take away my house.、Okay? 
my, my credit score might be ruined, but it's an option that I have, and under some circumstances, people, a rational person, would use it. Again, is this something that should be included in the APR calculation? These are all choices that regulators make, regulators have to make. Okay, but these are choices that need to be subject to, uh, to debate and to scrutiny. So I'm kind of getting towards the end, um, and before I summarize, I want to say a few words about disclosure as, as science. Under the traditional approach, and this is the way most disclosure regulations were done until relatively recently, basically the idea was that if there is a piece of information that we think that consumers need or investors need, then we just add this to the list of disclosures. And indeed, you know, when you go and get a mortgage in the U.S., you have this pack of, you know, pages this thick with all the information that you're supposed to know before you choose which mortgage to take. Now, this is one approach. This is the conventional approach to disclosure. This is a disclosure. These are disclosures that are usually ignored. They're ineffective. Okay, but then perhaps, and this is a question mark, but maybe also harmless. Okay, so I get this pack of pages. I don't read it. So it can't really affect me in any uh, bad way, maybe. But the new behaviorally informed paradigm is very different. This new paradigm adopts a scientific approach to disclosure, and I think this is a very useful and important advance. Now we actually use social scientific tools to figure out what disclosures work and what disclosures do not work, what type of forms work and what type of forms do not work, what people pay attention to, what people care about, what will affect their decisions most. This type of disclosure is effective, and it's extremely powerful. And because it's so effective and powerful, it raises these ethical considerations that are the subject of this conference, something that we actually need to, to think about and think about carefully. And so given this new paradigm of disclosure, I want to kind of raise maybe a kind of provocative question of whether disclosure is still a, the paradigmatic, or one of the paradigmatic examples of soft paternalism. And I want to kind of build on one distinction that Professor Sunstein suggested to us yesterday, the distinction between a regulation that focuses on means versus regulation that focuses on ends. I think that definitely when we were talking about the traditional approach to disclosure, this is an approach that focuses on means. I give you the information, and you make whatever decision you think is, is best, whatever decision is right for you. It enhances your autonomy. Improves your kind of well-being. The behaviorally informed approach to disclosure, I want to suggest, at least in some cases, maybe in most cases, does start does start with the end. Okay, there is a certain end that the regulator, that the policymaker, wants to achieve a certain goal, and this could be reducing the amount of smoking, the number of people who smoke, reducing obesity, reducing irresponsible borrowing, back to consumer finance. And the regulator knows that with a certain disclosure designed with this scientific approach that I just mentioned to you, the regulator can achieve the desired goal. And through this sophisticated disclosure, this behaviorally informed disclosure, I can have a successful and effective intervention, maybe as effective as um, a tax or a subsidy, maybe even more effective. When I was teaching my kind of law economics and psychology class, this was NYU before I moved to Harvard, I had a student who raised uh, his hand and said, you know, my brother is a doctor, and my brother, the doctor, says that, you know, I, as a doctor, I have to disclose information, informed consent to my patients. Mm -hmm. But the doctor said, I can disclose the information in a way that will achieve the result that I want. The doctor said, I am in such a position of superiority in terms of my knowledge and information, that I can disclose and frame the information that I need to tell the patient in a way that I can get the exact decision or choice that I think is the right choice. And so this is the power of this kind of behaviorally informed disclosure. You can, get, you can know exactly what choice is going to be made, at least by a substantial uh, proportion of the people receiving this disclosure. And so if disclosure is so powerful and so effective, is it still soft paternalism? And so I want to conclude by identifying a mismatch, I believe, between the power of disclosure under the new paradigm and the minimal scrutiny that disclosure regulation receives 
based still on the older paradigm, the disclosure is just about providing information through, to be used by a rational individual through a system to deliberative uh, process. And so I, just to make sure I'm not misunderstood, I'm a big fan of disclosure regulation. I think that this is one of the first things that we should think about and try as regulators and as policymakers when we are faced with a substantial kind of policy issue, policy problem. But I just want to kind of raise this uh, kind of flag and say that disclosure is, because of its power, should probably deceive, receive more scrutiny uh, than it currently does. Thank you, Oren, for this plea for enlightened disclosure. <laughs> and um, we continue with Christine Erter. She's with the uh, UK Financial Services Commission. That is a regulatory and oversight agency for financial markets. And it's the only one in Europe, as I think, that has aggressively embraced mm -hmm. uh, behavioral approaches. And we're eager to learn about the experiences you and your colleagues have made. Okay. Um I'm a spellologist, I don't have a presentation because I hadn't realized that this session is just after lunch, so I would have added some um, cartoons or jokes, but I don't have those. And I'll talk from my chair because this is probably the first and last time I'll, this is the closest I'll ever be to a talk show setting, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to savor this, so apologies. Okay, so thank you for organizing the event and for uh, inviting me to speak. As I said, I work for the Financial Conduct Authority, so we are the financial regulator in the UK. We regulate the behaviour of firms in relation to, say, bank accounts, investment products, insurance, mortgages, the issues like mis-selling or people are not provided with enough information or whether they're rogue traders and so on. So, um, as there are so many lawyers in this room, I'll start with a legal disclaimer. I'll read it out. While I'll be talking about the work done by the FCA, I'm talking in a personal capacity. All views expressed are mine and do not represent the views of the FCA. I hope this is on record, right? So, yes. Okay. Great. Duly noted. <laughs> yeah. So, for you, uh, there have been a lot of debates about government interaction with individuals. For you to understand the perspective that I'm presenting, I need to explain what we're aiming to achieve. So we have three objectives that have been set for us by the UK government. Firstly, to, I'm quoting, to secure an appropriate degree of protection for consumers. Secondly, to promote effective competition in the interest of consumers. And thirdly, to protect and enhance the integrity of the financial system in the UK. So our mandate by the design is already quite paternalistic. Um, I need to deviate from my script a bit and, and the light of the previous presentations explain what we mean by the competition mandate. So from, last, from next year, we, or, well, from this April, we'll be able to enforce antitrust competition law. But in addition to that, what's so specific about UK competition, the remit of UK competition authorities, is that we actually look at markets that do not work as a whole. So they may appear competitive, but there might be some things like consumer biases that may lead to uh, bad outcomes for consumers. So we do investigate these sorts of issues that are not traditionally investigated in antitrust cases. Okay. So the evidence on consumer biases raise many questions about how to interpret our objectives in practice. I mean, what is appropriate degree of protection for consumers where they make mistakes because of biases. So last year we published a think piece that brought together the available evidence and from the academic research and we also tried to provide a framework for how we could embed behavioral economics into practice, what sort of questions it would raise, what sort of evidence we would have to gather and so on. I will not talk uh, about the framework today, but if you're interested, look up FCA's first occasional paper. This is the first advertisement of the stock, there'll be more. Uh, okay, so in my 15 minutes, I want to make two further observations on the nudging debate from a regulatory economist perspective and give some examples of our work. My first observation will be that the debate about rationale for nudging should not underplay the role of firms and competition in shaping consumer choices. And my second, nudging, uh, sorry, my second observation is that nudging should not always be the preferred course of action, and sometimes there are good reasons for why more interventionist measures are needed. Okay. My first observation is the following. The arguments for and against of paternalism often underplay the role of firms and competition. But as we know, firms and markets shape consumer choices through product design, marketing and the sales process. 
and often in directions that are not really in consumers' interest. For example, from my own experience, a couple of years ago, my car insurer sent me a letter saying that my policy is due for renewal, quoted the new premium and assured me that I didn't have to do anything, it would just be auto-renewed. However, after spending five minutes online, I found that I can get a better deal from its sister company that would save me around 450 euros a year. I mean, this is a big benefit of shopping around. So was this auto-renewal in my interests? Well, yes, it ensured that if I forget to renew the insurance myself, at least I will be covered, so we would not be in a situation where people are not covered, despite the benefit, but arguably it also nudged me to just to stick to what I have. Furthermore, competition does not always provide an answer. There is a lot of um, empirical and theoretical papers on business mod mod showing that business models that exploit biases can actually be sustainable in a marketplace that appears relatively competitive. I mean, the results are so very well established in behavioral industrial organization literature, and we both attended the recent conference where this issue was explored. So if you're not aware of this literature, it's worth having a look. So I think the role of regulator should mostly be considered in this particular context. To, see, to some extent, we can be seen as aiming to help protect consumers from exploitative firm or market practices, rather than aiming to protect consumers from their own selves. For example, we can assess how product features, marketing and sales strategies affect outcomes in the market and, as, and think about whether there is a case for denudging or changing the choice environment in a different direction. To give you an example of our recent work, um, last year we completed our first competition market study. This focused on general insurance add-on products. So this is the sort of insurance that's sold together uh, with products like mobile phones, cars, or holiday packages. Usually you have already decided on your, on your handset, you're so excited, you want to unwrap the package, and they said, oh, by the way, you know, if, if it breaks down, I want to sell you an, an add-on cover that covers the, the cost. So we found that the financial value of these products is often poor if you look at the claims ratio, and this is just a proxy of financial value, of course there are other costs, uh, which is the proportion of premiums received by firms that are paid back to consumers out as claims. Uh, the value was substantially lower than for more mainstream general insurance products. So in the case of some, uh, some products, for example, personal accident insurance or guaranteed asset protection insurance, something sold alongside cars. The claims ratio were except exceptionally low, 10% or less. That means 10% of the money that's received by the uh, insurer in premiums is actually paid back to consumers when, when they make a claim. In this particular case, we were concerned that the fact that these products were sold as add-ons, so this add-on mechanism was what was triggering biases and may result in consumers not shopping around, which lead to ineffective competition and poor value. So to explore this uh, hypothesis, my colleagues did a behavioral online experiment which tested consumers' reactions to different ways in which add-on was sold. For example, um, and the products were like tablet computers, a boiler, a laptop, uh, a holiday, and I think 12-day car ins insurance on your rental car, or something like that. So in some settings, we presented the add-on um, just next to the primary product, so when you were searching for your laptop, you also saw the add-on price up front, and in some settings, it was drip-fed, so after you had already chosen your, um, your laptop, you were then <coughs> revealed the add-on price and you had to, make, had to make a decision about whether or not to shop around more or take that offer. We also looked at whether the, the price format and access to alternative standalone insurance actually affected the likelihood of consumers buying insurance and their ability to shop around effectively. And this is my second commercial of this speech. You can find more detail in occasional paper number three. Okay, so we found that the practice of drip feeding add-ons actually had uh, at the point, at the point of sale of the primary product rather than earlier is a very, very powerful barrier to consumers looking for alternatives. I mean, I think you would, you would assume that that must be the case, but probably mostly people underestimate the magnitude of this, uh, this effect. For example, when add-on price was available up front, only 17% of participants bought the first insurance offer they had seen. But when the add-on price was drip-fed, nearly four times more, or 65% of add-on buyers took up the offer without looking at any other, other prices offered. And it was really simple to do this in the experiment. You had to basically click twice. 
Of course, these experimental results were not taken at face value. We're well aware of the limits of the experiments, but it's also worth emphasizing that experiments can actually provide insights that we would not be able to get otherwise. And this is the bit that people often miss. The findings were interpreted alongside a wealth of other evidence, including firm data analysis and consumer surveys, like cons consumer focus groups and so on. Um, and in fact, the behavioral economics findings informed Informed, can inform regulation not just with its clever experiments or randomized control, control, randomized control trials that you can later refer to. That's, that's the bit that people usually get really excited about. What is more important is that it actually informs how we think about problems and, and formulate our hypothesis about problems. So, as a result, we proposed a package of interventions, and there were two particularly behavioral ones. Firstly, we proposed that um, banning pre-tick boxes, or so-called opt-outs, where consumers have to actively opt out from buying the insurance. And secondly, uh, we proposed imp imposed a deferred opt-in on add-on sales of this guaranteed asset protection product that was sold alongside cars because we were particularly <coughs> worried about it. And so the proposal <coughs> is to introduce this pause um, in the purchasing pro process, which creates time for the customer away from the sales environment to consider the options and make a decision. Okay, I'll now turn to my second observation, which is my last observation, uh, is that while there is a lot of focus on the legitimacy of nudging and smarter disclosure, and, and there should be a lot of focus on it, I think much more debate is needed on how, about how regulators should choose between the softer and more interventionist measures in practice particularly when there is so much uncertainty about how effective nudges and disclosure could be, and doing nothing mostly is not an option. Of course, nudges and disclosure are useful because they provide an alternative to the more intrusive interventions. But while we know that disclosure has not, has not really been very effective in the past, and, and there is scope to make it smarter, including by making more use of nudges, it is actually really difficult to know how effective even the best designed disclosure could be, and how effective the best designed disclosure that's designed by regulators could be. Undoubtedly, there are areas where there is scope to make disclosure more effective, uh, in particular where the current disclosure is poorly designed because the firm just has no incentives to get it right. It's the same as with cases with information asymmetry, where the firm has no incentives to re reveal you this type of information. However, regulators should recognize that the consumer psychology is so nuanced and specific interventions can succeed or fail on small details. So I think it's worth asking whether there are markets where consumers are just so disengaged or the products so complex or consequences of bad decisions so dramatic that disclosure will just not make a difference. I mean, there is a great book that's written on this by Shahar and Schneider where they argue that we are provided with... with uh, that the disclosure we are provided with by well-meaning regulators is really more than we ever wanted to know. I mean, I can definitely agree to that based on my personal experience. So, I suggest that the way forward for regulators is to, firstly, be realistic about how effective, or maybe even more importantly, ineffective, soft measures could be, and subject it to rigorous ex-ante and ex-post testing. Secondly, keep in mind that not all solutions to behavioural problems need to be behavioural in nature, and interventions like imposing stronger product governance standards, standards, banning or restricting product features may still be highly relevant, even when you can design good nudges. And if you think about it, being <coughs> realistic about how ineffective disclosure could be is actually really hard in practice, because that means you have to go against your most basic <coughs> intuitions about what should be working. For example, we recently collected consumer transaction level data from banks. We wanted to assess the, effect, the impact of providing personal current account uh, customers, I guess these are called checking accounts in the, UK, in the US, uh, with annual summary statements that tell them about costs and charges incurred in the last year. These were introduced by the industry following a review by the competition authorities a couple of years ago because um, the competition authorities had a, were really concerned about the lack of transparency of charges. And basically in the, in the UK, the, the current account is free if you're in credit, though, so you, the, the costs of providing the account are actually quite shrouded. So, actually a quick test. Um, how many of you think that the effect of these charges uh, of these annual statements on reducing overdraft charges were higher than 10%? Hands? 
No? How many of you think that they were below 10%? And uh, the, the rest of you decide to remain agnostic and just think it's not, it's not a relevant paragraph? Okay, well, well done. We found these uh, to have had a zero effect on reducing <laughs> overdraft charges incurred by consumers. Okay, this may be funny, and some of you may say this was expected. And actually, this is quite a common reaction, is that, oh, I knew this already, or well, this, isn't this boring? But actually, this sort of hard evidence, rather than intuitions, about what works and what does not, is what really helps steer policy decisions, so you really need it. And yes, maybe I could argue that there is a need for more boring behavioral findings. So the full details, this is the third advertisement, the full details of this work will, will be published later this year, probably in OP5 or something like that. Okay, but in the light of this whole debate, I want to conclude with the thought that actually there is a case, um, but we, we must recognize that there, is a, there are cases when products are just so complex so, um, that we should really think about more interventionist measures and we should not let this debate about nudging, I mean, we should still consider nudges and disclosure, we should not let that distract us from seriously considering, considering those alternatives, given their costs and unintended consequences and so on. For example, this August we decided to um, prevent firms from selling very complex investment products called COCOs to ordinary retail investors. I mean, this was like a judgment call, because we were worried that this was a product that was becoming more and more popular amongst the average population in the UK, like, I don't know, older people who are searching for a return in the low interest rate environment, but they're really risky products that actually, if you invest a substantial share of your wealth in them, you, you may risk losing quite a bit of money. So this, this was a sort of judgment call we made. And probably the most prominent example um, is, is my colleague's work on the price cap on high cost consumer credit, which is obviously a highly uh, politically charged question. Uh, so this cap came into force in January. Uh, the decision to impose a cap was actually made by the government and then we were asked to design and implement it. Um, the government was concerned about the extremely high interest rates on payday loans, putting customers in a spiral of debt. But designing the cap is really difficult as you have to stride the right balance. If the cap is too high, that is, interest rate is too low, you basically risk not having a viable market and many consumers may not have access to credit with unclear welfare consequences to them. But if the cap is too low, that is the rate the firms can charge is too high, we risk not having an adequate consumer protection. So, I mean, where do you strike the balance? So, my colleagues and, and consultants did quite a bit of really hardcore modeling uh, but the, to arrive at the cap. But the million dollar question is really about whether those estimated 70,000 customers who will no, no longer have access to pay their loans after the cap will be worse off as a result. As part of the research, we actually gathered some evidence that suggested that may, they may not actually be worse off at the end. For example, we used transaction level data to compare the outcomes outcomes between two groups of consumers, those who just got the, uh, got the pay their loan and those who just didn't. So it's almost like a natural experiment. You have two groups whose characteristics in terms of credit score and so on is very similar. So you can, we, we track their outcomes over time, including whether they uh, went behind on their other loans or, or missed their, missed their uh, bills and so on. And we find that actually on average, those consumers who took out the loan were worse off than those who didn't. They were more likely to exceed their overdraft limits, miss payments of other debts, and worsen their credit score. And from other consumer research, we found that actually 30% of consumers regret taking these, out these loans in the first place. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, and to refer to a piece of research that I believe Mr. Sunstein referred to yesterday, there is some evidence from other countries um, that sometimes price interventions can make consumers better off. For example, uh, academics in the, found that the 2009 US Card Act that imposed a limit on credit cards fees actually reduced overall borrowing costs and saved US consumers some 20 um, billion dollars per year. I mean, yesterday that present, evidence presented that was presented as a benefit of nudges, I'm presenting it as a benefit of um, price intervention, so I think you should go back and read the paper to make up your own mind. Okay, so I hope I gave you an insight into our work, but I want to leave with some questions, which to make, make maybe to academics, which are, what should we do when people are harmed but nudges do not work? 
How do we find out in the first place that nudges do not work? Should we favor paternalistic interventions in such cases? But how could we intervene in a way that also allows for innovation and competition? Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, for this insight into the workshop of a regulator. And now, Lars Klön uh, will talk to us. He is a law professor in Munich and deals with regulation of uh, financial markets. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start with uh, three pre preliminary remarks. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Second, uh, what I'm going to say will be very provocative, especially for this crowd, because I'm going to try to give you an example where I think behavior economics actually do not work, but, but will, might actually cause some harm. Um, second or third, uh, due to the time constraints, uh, I will only state my case. I know there are a couple of counter-arguments, which I would discuss, but due to the time constraints, I will not discuss them, so it's going to be even more provocative. Um, mm -hmm. This as a disclaimer. All right, so let's go. Um, the, the paradigm of modern securities regulation is the disclosure paradigm. As Louis Loss, the nester of US securities regulation, put it, securities laws are all about disclosure, again disclosure, and still more disclosure on the one hand, and an insider trading ban to prevent market participants from trading on undisclosed information on the other hand. In the wake of several stock market frenzies and crashes, it has been questioned by many scholars whether the disclosure paradigm should be reconsidered. And this general question recurs in the more concrete question of how rational the reasonable investor is. This question is important for both the insider trading ban and the various disclosure duties in the US and in the EU. Both concepts or both legal regimes agree that insider trading occurs on the basis of non-public information, which if disclosed to the public would likely have a significant impact on stock prices. Um, that's information which is considered to be material in the EU, we say relevant. Moreover, both legal regimes agree that only material that is relevant information must be disclosed under the various disclosure requirements. Finally, there is a consensus uh, that the question whether or not an information is material must be assessed from the perspective of a reasonable investor. So who is the reasonable investor? US courts um, understand the reasonable investor to be a personification of an efficient market. So they basically see the reasonable investor as an alter ego um, of a market which values stocks rationally and on the basis of all publicly available information. Of course, after more than 30 years of behavioral research in the field of financial economics, we know that in reality, securities markets are not always efficient. Um, so at first glance, it would seem rational for investors to take those deviations into account. Therefore, the policy question is whether we should make the reasonable investor test developed by U.S. courts more compatible with reality. The German Federal Court of Justice seems to have done exactly this. In an obita dictum to its uh, EKB judgment, which is very important in 2012, the court stated that reasonable investors account for foreseeable irrational reactions of other market participants. And you can see how this gives the court a way to reshape disclosure duties in certain cases. Let's say there is a big stock market reaction. Many people bought stock. It turns out that the, the, the disclosure was actually wrong. The court can say, well, this was an irrational market reaction, but the reasonable investor will take that into account, so it's material information, and that's why uh, you can base a claim on it. Um, so it open, kind of opens the door, I think, for, for the court to, to uh, interfere or to regulate, or however you want to call it. Um, which court is right, or which case law is right? I think we can best answer this question by looking at a hypothetical. Economists Michael J. Cooper and his colleagues found out that at the height of the dot-com mania from June 1998 till July 1999, publicly listed firms could increase shareholder value by simply adding a dot-com or dot-net to their firm names. 
This dot-com effect was independent, sorry, independent of whether the firm's business was actually internet-related, which suggests that this effect was irrational. And I think we all can think of some biases and heuristics that might have uh, caused this, this reaction. So um, let's assume that a uh, firm called A, a publicly listed company in the EU, wants to change its name from A to A.com. Let's further assume that this name change, the new name, does neither change the fundamental value of the company, nor does it signal to the market that the firm has been undervalued before. Finally, let's suppose that nevertheless we can expect the stock price to rise after the planned name change has become publicly known due to a foreseeable non-rational investor reaction. Is A required to disclose the projected name change? Does X, a member of A's management board, violate the insider trading ban if he buys A stock before the name change becomes publicly known? To answer those questions, we have to take a deeper look into why insider trading is banned and why the disclosure of certain information is mandated. Intuitively, we'd probably say that insider trading is banned because uninformed investors lose money to insiders and disclosure is required to guide investors to better investment decisions. That view, however, would be a little too short-sighted or too narrow. Um, and to see why, we'll have to take a deeper look into the basic economics of securities trading. All right, so here comes a simple market model. Uh, on capital markets, there are basically two types of traders. Information traders, um, who seek out information to gain an informational advantage vis-a-vis -vis other traders. That is, they try to identify arbitrage opportunities. So they buy, stock, sorry, they buy stocks which, in their views, are undervalued by the market, and they sell stocks which are overvalued. On the other side, utilitarian traders, also called liquidity traders, um, they do not try to identify arbitrage opportunities. They trade for other reasons, such as to hedge against risk or to uh, uh, invest their funds in a diversified portfolio to earn a market return. So they stay rationally uninformed and their trading is independent of whether current prices of financial instruments reflect, reflect uh, their true value. Warren Buffett is an information trader. He's looking for arbitrage opportunities. You and I, if we're rational, we are not information traders because we don't try to beat the market. We just want, hopefully, to diversify our portfolio and earn the market return. Are we, are utilitarian traders harmed by insider trading? The perhaps surprising answer is no. Imagine the current stock price of an issuer I is at 20 euros, but its true value is 30. Insiders know that and drive up the stock price from 20 to 30. This, of course, is a very ideal assumption, so uh, it's, it's, it's basically just linear, linear progression, but it's just for, for the sake of argumentation. So let's just assume the stock price slowly but surely increases to, from 20 to 30. Without the insider trading, the stock price would have constantly remained at 20, so there is no fundamental value change, there is no new information coming out, um, and so on. Imagine you're a portfolio investor and you're trading during the insider trading period. Are you harmed? Well, that depends. If you're a buyer, you are harmed because you will pay a higher price than in the absence of insider trading, right? Depending on when you trade. If you're a seller, you actually gain from insider trading because you receive a higher price than you would have received without insider trading. The bottom line is, as a utilitarian trader, you don't care about insider trading as long as, from an ex-ante perspective, it's as likely to be harmed by insider trading than to, lose money from inside, than to gain money from insider trading. That condition, however, is always met because, by definition, as a utilitarian trader, your trading is independent of stock price movements. It's completely random whether, during that period, you'll be a seller or you'll be a buyer. That's why you don't care about insider trading. Put differently, utilitarian traders can completely diversify away insider trading risk. The same is not true for information traders. Let's now imagine you're an information trader and you notice that without any new information coming to the market, being disclosed, the price moves up. 
There are two possible explanations for this price movement. Could be insider trading, could be noise. That is, uninformed investors driving away prices from their fundamental value. Noise is exactly what you're looking for as an information trader, because when noise traders trade and move away prices, that's when arbitrage opportunities are created. So in that situation, for you as an information trader, it's rational to sell some I stock and then to buy it back. Sorry. And then, how did that happen? Okay. Then to buy it back once the, the stock has regained its value of 20. That will work out fine in all cases in which it's actually noise traders driving away prices, but it won't work um, in our case, because in our case, the Fundamental value is actually not 20, but 30, so you lose money. So, unlike utilitarian traders, information traders will always lose money to insiders. Outside information traders and insiders cannot coexist. The reason is that unlike utilitarian traders, information traders trading is dependent on price movements. It's linked to price movements. Information traders trade because prices are moving. Put differently, information traders cannot diversify away insider trading risk. So in conclusion, we see that the insider trading ban is, protected to, uh, is designed to protect information traders and information traders only, or as uh, legal scholars Zohar Goshen and Gideon Parkomovsky have put it in their paper in 2006 on the essential role of securities regulation, its purpose is to create a competitive market for information traders. And the same is true for disclosure obligations. Disclosure requirements are not designed to protect portfolio investors because portfolio investors do not care about information. They stay rationally uninformed. So it's only information traders who actually read information. So they are, those provisions are designed to protect information traders. So to solve our hypothetical of A and A.com, we have to answer one single question. Do information traders have a stake in the information about the name change? Are they interested in the disclosure of this information? Are they harmed by insider trading on the basis of this information? Let's start with the last question, question the insider trading question. Let's assume that um, A stock's price, A's stock price is 20, and due to the name change, it's expected to rise to 30 and to finally reach 20, depending on how high the frenzy is and how many people dare to, to bet against the irrational or non-rational masses. Um, let's first assume that the information about the name change qualifies as material information, so insider trading is banned. In that situation, if we assume everybody observes the law, the price will not rise until the name change is publicly known. Then, once it becomes publicly known, once there is disclosure, the stock price will rise due to noise traders, and that's when information traders sell a stock to the market. Information traders plan to wait until the, the, the price has regained its pre-disclosure level, and that's when they buy back the previously sold shares. Okay, let's now assume that insider trading on this information is allowed, so it's, it doesn't qualify as a material information. Everybody can trade on it if he or she wants to. What happens in this world? In this world, insiders will start buying a stock once they know of the information, once they know the name is going to be changed. So insiders start buying stock, and information traders will sell stock to the insiders, because they will, or they will not know if, it, if it, it could be noise. So they will sell some A stock. Then the information becomes publicly known, and that's when information traders will continue to sell A stock to the market, hoping to be able to buy it back at a lower price, which will eventually happen, because we assume that the fundamental value of the company has not changed. So the or note that in the second scenario, information traders behave in the exact same way as in the first scenario. The only difference is that in the first scenario, information traders sell a stock after the disclosure of the name change, whereas in the second scenario, in this scenario, they start selling a stock once the prices rises, or once the price rises due to the insider trading. 
So the effect of qualifying the information about the name change as material information simply is to delay insider uh, information traders selling of a stock until after the disclosure. That's the effect of qualifying this information as material information. If we asked all information traders whether they would prefer the information about the name change to be material information, their answer would be no. Because they are indifferent as to whether to sell a stock before or after the disclosure of this information. Put differently, information traders would not want legal protection against insiders anticipating noise trading. Do information traders want the disclosure of the name change? It should be quite obvious that they do not want the name change to be, to be disclosed because it's create, it only creates noise. It creates noise trading, the foreseeable irrational market reaction. Um, information traders do not trade on this information. They're not afraid of insider trading on the basis of this information, so they don't want the information to be disclosed to prevent insider trading. Uh, and finally, um, they would vote against disclosing the information because it increases insider uh, noise trader risk. So in conclusion, information traders do not have to be protected against insiders anticipating noise. That is, to be protected against insider trading on the basis of information that will trigger foreseeable non-rare reaction non-rational, sorry, market reaction. Uh, they do not want issues to be required to publicly disclose such information, and that's why the reasonable investor test, as developed by US courts, actually got it right and should not be altered due to the insights of behavioral finance. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I think this is a perfect setting for discussion. We first heard that uh, we need more intelligent disclosure. Then we heard that disclosure is not enough. And now we learned that it's not, not of no use at all. <laughs> so um, the floor is yours. And um, I'm taking questions. Can I ask a question? Of course. Go ahead. Um, so this is a question to Lars, just to make sure I understand the story. So the way I understood your argument is that the utilitarian traders, they don't care. Okay? They don't care about this at all. And so there is, so, but there is money uh, to be made, the money that is being from the dot-com disclosure, the money being made off the backs of the, of the kind of irrational um, traders. And so the question is, who gets this money? It's either the inside, insiders or the information investors. So this is, there's some kind of a way to kind of divide this, this extra money that we are making off the backs of the, um, the behavior, the less sophisticated investors. And I would think, kind of my intuition is, that we actually want to, um, and you said, I, I thought initially you were gonna say that the liquidity investors, the kind of the utilitarian traders, they don't care, but that the um, information investors, they do care because they're gonna be losing money to the insiders. And then you said that they also don't care, which I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I understand why. But if there is this money to be made off the back of the less sophisticated investors, and we now need to decide who gets this, a sh you know, the share, a bigger share of this money, the insiders or the outsiders, Warren Buffett or some insider CEO, I thought we want to protect Warren Buffett. I thought we want to encourage these information traders because they are, you know, in Tony Cronman's word, this is deliberately acquired information. They acquire information, they make the market more competitive, as you mentioned, we want to encourage them. And we don't care about the insiders who get these, um, you know, the casually acquired information. And so, what am I missing? Why do we not want to uh, prohibit insider trading in order, including on these dot-com type stuff, in order to shift more money on to uh, the information investors? Um, well, I think I don't agree, I don't completely agree with, with your premise. Um, because when you say that there is money to be made, um, it, um, it, it indicates or implies that, um, that, the, 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 that noise traders or that, that irrational traders uh, lose money. The point is that utilitarian traders whose trading is independent of price movements um, don't even care whether securities prices reflect, reflect true values. They don't, they, don't care about, they, don't, they don't even care about misinformation to the market because sometimes they'll win, sometimes they'll lose depending on what side of the trade they're on and that's why um, they can diversify away this risk. 
They, when I said um, they are not interested at all, that's actually a little overstatement. They are marginally interested because in a market with insider trading risk, bid ask spreads are higher. That's why trading costs are higher. So, and, and that's a, a, a loss for utilitarian traders as well. But by by assumption, if your trading is independent of price movements and the, pri the, the price doesn't reflect the true value of the company, then sometimes you will win, sometimes you lose. And if, if the ex-ante possibilities are the same, you don't care. But insider, insider traders, they make money, right? They're supposed to make a lot of money. Um, so how? Okay, that's, that's, I, I, was, I was getting to oh, sorry. this. The, so you, you are right, you are right that um, if we allow... If in my example, A to A.com, if we allow insider trading, we'll allow insiders to profit from this. Um, so who's on the losing side? Um, information traders would be on the losing side if this was information that really changed the, the value of the company or if the market is so inefficient that it, this, um, this uh, uh, will last longer, for a longer period of time, okay? If not, then insiders will lose money if they don't get rid of the stock um, soon enough, and in the end, information traders will win because the price will bounce back to 20. So, so if you're an insider buying at 21, and you hold on to that stock until it reaches 20 again, then you're on the losing side. So that's in, then it's insiders who will lose. If it's insiders who sell at, at the peak of the irrational uh, market height, um, they will win, uh, and the losers could, could basically could be, could be anybody. But, but why would insiders lose? I mean, they, they, will, they will always... Uh, profit from, from, from trading on inside information if, if it's material. And well, only then they need to disclose it. So uh, how would they ever lose unless they make a serious mistake, kind well, of? That, that's, that, that was the, um, th this is the special, special element of my, of my um, example. In my example, it's an information which does not change the fundamental value of the company. So the price goes up due to rationality and then it goes down again. If insiders, insiders will buy in the up, once, once the stock goes up, if they don't sell before the stock goes down again, they will lose money. So the argument only applies to information that maybe or looks material but isn't in substance. Is that exactly. true? Exactly. Only in and this case, disclosure is not needed. And only if insiders don't know when to get out. Right, okay. right, right. Well, I mean, sometimes it can happen very quickly. Okay, but, but it's not... A, it's, so your argument is not against the prohibition of insider trading as oh, no. such, but oh, no. only applies to information that is prima facie or irrationally regarded as material, but right. in reality it isn't. Right. The question I was trying to discuss was whether we should expand the insider trading ban and disclosure obligations to information which trigger foreseeable irrational market reactions as the German Federal Court suggested. Okay. Done? I can ask more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe later. Later. So, um, Mr. McCoggan. Yeah. Uh, a question probably, um, a question especially to Mr. Bargill. Um, it seems to me that a lot of what we are doing is that we look at sort of nudges which happen uh, through, pri through the private sector and identify them as sort of harmful. So, uh, one example would be to hide uh, non-salient price dimensions and such. Um, and what's, what it seems to me is that we are sort of playing a catch-up game of sort of running after the private sector and sort of cleaning up whatever they use to deceive consumers. Um, but of course they have, I don't know how many years of marketing experience and they know how this stuff works, I think, m much better than anyone else does. Um, my question is, maybe should there be a change of approach? And this sort of directly um, correlates to the ethics question of this entire uh, of this entire event, when you think about, we're asking, are there nudges which are unethical for the government or for government intervention? Maybe we can also ask the question, are there nudges or what are forms of nudges which are, without running after people who, without looking at a certain example, can we say abstract 
this or that is not right for the private sector? And should we maybe think about sort of regulation which targets certain practices without sort of going after what the private sector does? Um, thanks. So a, a few things in response. Um, so we did discuss, I believe, kind of in the, before lunch, the possibility of participants in the market using nudges in order to maximize their profits. We talked about this in kind of the monopoly context. We said that this can happen also in, uh, in competitive markets. Um, Christina said that kind of the FCA, when they're doing competition enforcement, they're thinking not only about monopolies, but also in kind of competitors that are using nudges. And so I think there is definitely an understanding that we need to be, um, we need to be careful, we need to be kind of watchful uh, on the kind of the private market. And where the market fails, for, you know, for behavioral reasons and other reasons, there is room for, you know, to consider interventions um, by regulators. Another thing that I think really important comes out of maybe the beginning of your question, we were saying how we are kind of playing catch up with the market, you know, these kind of marketing experts over there who are um, always ahead of us. I think this is also leads to a very important um, distinction between two types of regulatory environments. And Christina mentioned this, I think at least alluded to it in her comments. There are situations, and when she said that we need to really be careful about how markets respond, um, we need to be careful about the alignment or misalignment of the market's incentives with the incentives of regulators. And there's kind of a very important uh, paper by um, Naibar, Mulanathan, and Shafir that makes this distinction and says that sometimes we are kind of fighting the market. Okay? So when we're talking about, say, consumer credit products, if we try to regulate in one way, the market will try to push back. By the way, that happens when we try to regulate through nudges and when we try to regulate through caps, for example. Okay, so if we place a cap on one dimension, the market might respond by increasing another dimension. So we need to be very careful. The market will respond both ways in both instances. There are other situations where there is no misalignment of interest. So kind of the main example that people bring here is the regulation through nudges of, kind of retirement investments. Okay, so the employer here is not kind of, uh, in, in the employer's interests are not diametrically opposed to those of the employees as we might think in a seller-consumer context. And so this is a distinction that's very important and it requires often different types of regulatory responses, maybe sometimes harder regulatory responses. Um, and just kind of the final comment is that um, what we should do, and kind of the regulators in the room should, are probably doing, is we need to hire all these marketing experts from the private sectors so we can you know, beat them in their own game. I think what he was getting at, as, at least as I understood, was whether we could think of something like illegality to zero, enlightened illegality, so a general clause mm -hmm. that says sort of unethical nudges are illegal and so that you don't have to regulate after the fact, but that you have sort of a general prohibition of unethical nudging in the private sector and that would have to be applied by courts then on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, is that right? So uh, again, in kind of the same type, the same kind of three authors mm -hmm. have, you know, <laughs> you know sub, uh, advocated something similar. It's um, there is kind of a question of whether we can, you know, we say unethical, use these standards mm -hmm. in advance. Mm -hmm. What type, uh, what effect it has on markets? So one effect might be, and we usually it's an effect of uncertainty, is that people just be very afraid and they won't do a lot of things that are maybe borderline, maybe are unethical, maybe are not. Um, is this a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how much of a buffer or safety zone the market will, uh, will make and respond? What are the enforcement costs of these vague standards? So there are a lot of kind of standard considerations, kind of rule type standards, um, questions in this respect. Um, but, um, but it's definitely something to consider. Can I add to that? I think of course. In in practice, if you look at the, I don't know if you had examples in mind, but if you practice, look at specific practices, like I mentioned auto renewals or defaults or things like that, or bonus rates that are sometimes called teaser rates in products and so on, usually you can explain them in both ways. So you could say, oh, actually they're detrimental because they exploit biases, but usually you can also find something good in them. For example, you know, bonus rates do encourage you to shop around because they reward you for, for this activity and so on. So I don't, that's one reason for why you can't rule out most of these practices ex ante. So you, you need to apply an, uh, basically a case by case approach or at least develop some principles. And, uh, in terms of other nudges, I don't know. Well, it's, it's quite difficult with marketing because then you sort of, well, 
should we should we say that you cannot, for example, appeal to uh, product features that you do not think are actually in consumer interest? I, I remember that um, when I was flying here on the London tube, I, found, I saw a brilliant adver advertisement of an insurance product which said something along the lines of, does your insurer give you an, uh, an opportunity to win a football ticket? And I was thinking, well, oh, that's a great thing. Or is like, is this now a bundled product so you get insurance plus a lottery ticket or something like that? So, I mean, okay, this is, this is how the firm has decided to compete. And we want the consumer to be able to compare products, but are we really there to say, ooh, you should not... Uh, exploit consumer, or should we interpret this as exploitation, or you should not direct your attention to re irrelevant features. Another great example is uh, Meerkats, Meerkat soft toys. I don't know if you've, you've heard, um, it's a craze in the UK. So if you buy insurance through a certain comparison website, you can get this Meerkat toy. You can't get it otherwise. It's even resold on eBay, actually. Um, and there are all this, this whole, um, it's brilliant marketing, all these adverts that have been created because this Meerkat has got its personality, it's very cool, and so on. I mean, is, is this something that we should ban ex ante? I mean, I don't, I don't yes. think it is, because then... <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but if, if people genuinely, genuinely benefit from this meerkat toy, it, it does add to, to their welfare, maybe even more than the fact that they know that they're insured. I mean, who are, who are we to judge, is my question. So the question is, just unbundle it. You know? Sorry? For, Gerhard doesn't want to prohibit meerkats, just when they're bundled. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> bundled, <laughs> bundled meerkats, yeah. Introduce more competition for exactly. meerkats. So, please. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a question mostly to Warren Bargell, but perhaps also touching on the other um, discussants or panelists' intervention, and thank you for all your illuminating talks. Um, Warren, you said you wanted to raise a flag. Um, I was wondering what's on that flag. Um, you, I, I'm totally Meerkats. with you on a meerkat. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. That's going to be an interesting market problem. There's probably market failure in that. But anyways, um, uh, so I was, uh, I'm totally with you on your analysis of the normative uh, dimensions of information. Uh, information is not, as behavioral economics has shown in the vast majority of studies, um, uh, normatively neutral. So the way we frame and so on, uh, information really has big effects. So what are the consequences of this? I'm, I have two thoughts, and I was just wondering what, you, what your comments are on this. One is more abstract, one is more concrete. Uh, on an abstract level, I'm wondering whether that wouldn't invite us to use, um, make use of normative theory uh, in a broader sense that draws from legal theory, uh, welfare economics, and uh, let's say practical philosophy. People like Amartya Sen, for example, have combined, or John Harsony have combined those um, directions successfully, and that might be a direction, like sort of a normative turn in um, behavioral law and economics. Maybe that's uh, an interesting dimension to follow up on here, because all these normative questions keep popping up. The second uh, thought I had is, um, I'm not a constitution constitutional lawyer, um, but we're on the Verfassungsblog um, uh, conference, so I was wondering whether this had uh, consequences for delegation. Um, uh, we heard about the fuel economy example, and uh, Cass said that actually uh, somehow the legislator works out the law, and then the details are followed up by the EPA, and that's the way it works in Germany too, but what are the details? That's usually how the format is done, and how, you know, the nitty-gritty of, of the framing, actually. So I'm wondering whether that structure wouldn't have to be turned on its head if what's really having the impact is the concrete frame of the informational um, uh, material given, whether that wouldn't have to be decided by people other than uh, mere, um, I'm sorry, but, uh, uh, other than, uh, maybe by the legislature. <laughs> now be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wanted to say, uh, mere, mere cats, I wanted to say. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, so what's on the flag? Um, so you suggest maybe a kind of a new and better normative uh, theory in order to evaluate these types of interventions. Um, I, I don't feel competent to speak to that. What I do want to say, and this was my intention in my remarks, is that even if you know, uh, people like myself would kind of adopt kind of a welfare economics perspective, there is some serious welfare economics, cost-benefit analysis to do with respect to, um, to disclosure regulation. And as some of it is being done, I think more should be done, and they should be more sensitive to these behavioral effects, this kind of new disclosure paradigm. I think that in many types of regulation, 
when it's, you know, we're just doing disclosure. It kind of gives you almost a free pass in terms of uh, regulation. And I want to say, stop, do the kind of the type of cost-benefit analysis that you would do with other tools. Do it also carefully with respect to disclosure. Again, maybe, um, maybe we're doing it, maybe we're kind of beginning to do it, and maybe we should do more of it. In terms of uh, delegation, uh, so there are, of course, different theories of delegation between, say, the legislator and the regulatory agency. Um, and, you know, the different theories of delegation would come out differently in terms of your question. So if we think that uh, the legislator needs to deal with the most important issues and then delegate the kind of fine-tuning technical stuff um, to the regulator, then we might think, yes, now that we understand that uh, framing issues are so important in affecting behavior, then maybe it does make sense for you know, the legislator to pay attention to this and think carefully and not delegate it. Another theory of delegation goes to expertise. We delegate to these agencies because they are the experts. They have already uh, you know, um, recruited all the marketing experts from these companies, and they have the social scientists, the economists, and the psychologists figuring out exactly what works and what does not work. And so if that is our theory of delegation, then we still don't, we don't want, I guess, the legislators to do it. Thank you. This, you were the next speaker. Um, so it's a question seeking information from Christina Erta, really, from a regulator's point of view. So the, um, the House of Lords did some evidence taking a few years ago um, about um, the use of this kind of regulatory approach. Um, and it said the following. Um, so it said, we're concerned that emphasizing what they called non-regulatory interventions, basically nudging, um, will lead to policy decisions where the evidence for the effectiveness of other interventions in changing behavior has not been considered. Um, this would jeopardize the development of evidence-based effective and cost-effective policies. So in other words, what I think they're saying is that there's a danger that if you emphasize this particular regulatory technique, um, it will divert regulators from considering adequately other techniques that may be more effective. So it's a question really directed at the relationship that you were developing between what the effect is or how you choose between these different techniques. So I'm wondering whether you find evidence in your day-to-day -day practice of whether the availability of this kind of mechanism, as it were, leads to not considering more effective mechanisms or not. Okay. Um, so I think you had... There were two points. One, is, one was about basically whether or not we consider other types of interventions and whether we're transparent about it. And the second question about effectiveness. So to tackle the second question first, and as I tried to allude in my statement, we are trying to test these things out in practice. So obviously, kind of, it takes time. So you, you have to make a cost-benefit assessment of whether it makes sense to uh, test this particular, say, disclosure proposal. Is it worth testing? And that's something we've been quite... Um, not to say aggressive about, but we, we have emphasised that quite a lot. And I think it is really, really important to um, just to refer back to that book called More Than You Want to Know and so on, to, to keep considering those other types of interventions. And because of our mandate, we do have to, uh, we do have to publish a cost-benefit analysis whenever we propose a new, a new rule and that rule is consulted on. So all that evidence on effectiveness or ineffectiveness is there out in the public domain. So that's the bit of transparency. That's where we can be challenged. That's where people can say, well, actually, you know, there's no evidence on the fact that this will be effective or that, it, that it, w it will be worth the cost. So I hope that's a mechanism that sort of deals with those concerns. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I have much to add to it. I don't know if you answered your question or is there anything... Yeah. Please. Um, so it really related to whether, given the choice of different regulatory Tools. approaches, yeah. whether the availability of this tool and the degree to which it's now being emphasized leads to regulators following that lead, effectively being nudged into nudging, that leads them to not treat effectively, not consider the full range of regulatory approaches. I don't think so, because at least in our work, when 
also you can have a look at the at the published market study final reports where we do we do we do at times say we also considered these types of measures but but we ruled out them on these particular grounds so we definitely are not doing that um, and I think just to refer back to to your your points actually the sort of this we had the same debate when we just had disclosure and didn't have nudges. It was the same sort of question. Are we paying too much attention to disclosure just because it appears cheap and there, like, there is no opportunity cost? But I think if, if there are regulators who are not doing that, should definitely there should be more pressure on them from, from society. Professor Engel is next. I also have a question for Christine, and it's almost related to what we have before. Uh, I think you have to be very much praised for not only doing evidence-based regulation, but to generate your own evidence for the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I think this is extremely valuable, I also see a potential challenge here, and I would want to hear more about how your authority tackles the challenge. Because if it is known in advance that it is at least likely, if not mandated, that you will have to generate evidence of some kind before you can take some measure. This changes the game between the regulator and the regulatee in quite a tremendous fashion. And if I were a potential regulatee not liking some form of intervention, I would try to understand how I can beat you now on scientific grounds much more than on political grounds. So could you tell us a little bit about the political economy of a regulator itself generating its evidence. Now it um, gets interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I don't think that the game game has changed because we have always been collecting evidence and interpreting it and presenting it and there's always been scope for the regulate T to disagree and they often do that. So are you, you, you suggesting that because there is more uncertainty about the effectiveness of certain disclosure measures, for example, certain um, experimental techniques, we kind of put ourselves more on the spot? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, there's, lots, there's lots of choices to be made when yeah. you design your study. That's politics, of course. Yes. And yeah. how is that reflected in your designing process, for instance? This is not sure I can uh, respond fully to this question, but obviously we must make sure that, um, firstly, we're, we're, econ we're economists and we'll be challenged by economists and firms will hire economists and con economic consultancies to scrutinize our, our results. So we are presenting all those other sorts of results, but obviously we have to be mindful of what sort of effects or impacts uh, are in the mind of, say, I don't know, ministers or, or, or consumer groups and what sort of effects they're interested in, which affects our design of, of the study. But, I mean, we, we're just following scientific principles in the other sense. May I just quickly? Mm -hmm. So, Professor Engel, don't you think it's much better that we have a discussion on the experimental design rather on politics? Sure. There we go. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's great. Yeah. I think we should not be naive. Of I mean, we should not think this is just science. This is a, it's, it's a bundle between science and politics, and we have to reflect that fact. Well, so, so I want to just uh, push back just a tiny bit against the kind of the politics part. I, I mean, obviously, when you're designing an experiment or when you're writing up a, uh, you know, a theoretical model, there are choices that you need to make in terms of the assumptions and the statistical approaches. Do you think it's, we should call these choices politics? I mean, it's kind of part of, uh, you know, how we do good science. And so people might disagree about this, but it's not politics in that. And try to convince our mm. academic mm. colleagues. Mm. These guys mm. conceive of themselves as partly being academics, and partly they want to beat their opponent in the market. And that's what I find in highly intriguing, but I would want mm. to understand how they sort of do those inevitable trade-offs between mm -hmm. the scientific part of the thing and the politics part of the thing. Okay, one more what, what, uh, just, intervention just in uh, this Christine, um, context. Uh, how, how do you account for the possibility that you yourself, as a staff, as, as the staff might 
suffer from a bias and, and might then design an experiment to find a, a bias or an effect which you thought there is and, and then you'll find it because of confirmation bias or whatever. Excellent question. Actually, um, <laughs> on, the first, on the 1st of April last year, which is Fool's Day in the UK, there was an eight-page paper published on the Adam Smith blog. It was called uh, Applying Behavioral Economics to the Regulatory Conduct Authority. I don't know if you have heard of it. Would you, our, so our paper is called Applying Behavioral Economics at the uh, Financial Conduct Authority. So the authors basically took our executive summary, it replaced and replaced all references to consumers with regulators and then <laughs> tweaked some other contexts. So I highly recommend the paper. I fully endorse it. I think it's a good question to ask, especially on the, on the confirmation bias. Um, there are, I think, there are very, there are several good reasons for why this is a, not such a great concern as people sometimes assume. Because we do, I mean, there are many more people looking at different sorts of decisions from different perspectives. I mean, you do follow your our research is reviewed by academic peers often before it's published and so on. So there are these, if you will, safeguards. But to be honest, I think the question about uh, regulatory biases should actually, it merits more empirical research and not, not just regulatory biases actually, the biases of say, um, I don't know, specific lobby groups, specific consumer lobby groups, how do they choose the issues they pursue? I mean, is their position, are they subject to confirmation bias as well? Or have they actually realized what is the, uh, in the interest of the consumers are representing and so on? So they do merit um, more exploration and we're actually doing some thinking about this in-house. So. The only thing I can say, it's work in progress, maybe the, uh, rec rec recognizing that it's possible is the, is the first step to, mm -hmm. to finding Definitely. a solution. Yeah. So. Professor Sunstein is next. So I, I just had some comments. Uh, stand up. I'm actually going to stand up with the coat a little cold. So, uh, so these are three comments that, from the standpoint of someone who spent four years in government that bear on the discussion. So there's, uh, there's three hypotheses, I think, that are worth exploring. Hypothesis number one is that uh, a focus on uh, choice-preserving approaches distracts attention from more aggressive and possibly more effective regulatory proposals. That's, an, uh, I think, a common academic thought. Uh, I don't think there's any data that supports it. And in fact, if you look at what's happened in nations that have been interested in choice-preserving approaches, there's plenty of counter evidence that the ex exploration of those has no adverse effect on thinking of other approaches also when they're justified. So that's a, a plausible hypothesis without evidentiary support. And in the United States, it's palpably false that there is keen interest in choice-preserving approaches, but that doesn't mean that regulation of greenhouse gases and, as noted, credit card regulation that is not merely nudging, none of that has been ruled off the table. It's just part of a repertoire of tools. There's a second hypothesis that is that uh, regulators are subject to behavioral biases, too. That can't be false, exactly. Uh, but as noted, in, in well-functioning democracies, there's both public comment processes and peer review processes that are very severe constraints on the use of confirmation bias. If a regulator uses confirmation bias, at least in the United States and UK, they're highly vulnerable to ex post legal challenge, even if they're not subject to, which they are, ex ante, uh, public and peer review constraints. There's also careful retrospective analysis of, of regulatory bias, and it shows, no, it shows error, but no systematic bias one way or the other. So we just had to, it, it, I'm sure it's true in some ways, but we don't have evidence for that. So those are two kind of pleas for continued acquisition of evidence on things that I think are academically appealing as concerns, but they're actually um, uh, not supported by what we know. Thanks, there is one final question in the back and then we wrap up for lack of time. Pardon? Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, I have two questions. Uh, one was for Oren and um, I wanted to, to, well, it's an observation really, it seems in your present presentation, you're presenting uh, 
choice architectures as being somewhat manipulative because they are selecting information and presenting it to us in a framed manner. But not insisting upon disclosure is also a choice. It's a choice to let the status quo continue. And so you have to decide between one of these two options. And I think the question is, which of these options is better at promoting values that we find important, whether they're welfare, autonomy, dignity, and so on. And I think in almost every case, disclosure will improve uh, those values. The fact that it is selective, I think, is neither here nor there, because anything you do or don't do is selective. So I'm curious to hear your, your, your response to that. Um, my second question was, was for Lars. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit out of my comfort zone here, since I'm a constitutional lawyer. Um, but you say that portfolio investors stay rationally uninformed. So I'm thinking they would only be rationally uninformed if the hedge, the risks that, that arise from insider trading are perfectly hedged within the portfolio, it seems to me. That's a, that's a pretty strict assumption, I think. And secondly, I think those who are not the members of the portfolio but who are building it have to make decisions about how to hedge risk, and that will depend on how well, that will affect how well their portfolios perform. So they care, and they must stay rationally informed, especially if you're dealing with debt securities, which are rated by rating agencies and so on. The valuation of those securities, which any good portfolio has to take into account, has to be, is, must be rationally informed, it seems to me. So I wonder if your scenario, if the assumptions in your scenario insulate against those risks, then the, I think the question is, aren't those assumptions so demanding as to make this proposal uh, unworkable? Thank you. Um, okay, so, I, so thank you for the question. I did not mean to suggest that selective disclosure is necessarily manipulation. You know, following your comment from the morning, it's not <coughs> clear what manipulation means, but I, I don't mean it to imply manipulation. I actually think that selective disclosure is inevitable in the sense that, uh, or at least if we want disclosure to be effective, if you want to just, any piece of information that's plausibly relevant, just put it out there, like in this kind of pack of mortgage documents, then it's going to be ineffective, but then maybe, you know, so we should, maybe we should not care. Um, but if you want it to be effective, it has to be selective, and this does not, I do not intend to, have an, to make a normative judgment there. The normative point that I made is that we need to be careful in how we're making the selection. And so when you say that, um, I think I, I heard you say that, you know, disclosing will necessarily improve things or make things better. Uh, again, I, need, you need to, I think we need to be a little bit careful about what we mean by disclosure. If we're just adding a piece of information nobody reads, then it's not going to make anything better. If we're going to put this information or present it in a way that it's going to be salient and affect people's behavior, capture their attention, then it could make things better, but it could also make things worse. It might crowd out some other pieces of information that people were focusing on before. Do we know what is more important, what is less important? My point is just that we need to engage in kind of a serious welfare economics analysis, or if you have another normative objective in mind, a serious analysis on that objective in order to figure out whether disclosure is actually good or bad. Okay, um, thank you for the question. You raised doubts whether portfolio investors can really diversify away insider trading risk? I, I think they can. Um, imagine you're a portfolio investor. First of all, um, information or uninformed and informed trader re re refers to um, knowing an arbitrage opportunity or not. So it's all about identifying valuable information that's not known by the market or that's not impounded into the price yet. Um, Imagine you're such an investor, you don't look for any arbitrage opportunities because you, you don't think you can see any news that, that are not in the price already. Um, what do you do? You buy a completely diversified fund, and this fund will sometimes buy stock, sometimes sell stock, according to the market capitalization of all the stocks within the portfolio, right? To adjust to a certain index. I assume you, you buy an index fund. Um, and then, it, if it... it it, it completely depends on whether this fund will actually suffer or profit from insider trading. It depends on whether it's insiders driving prices up or down and whether in that situation you buy or sell. Um, if as a fund you only buy and sell be to adjust the portfolio to the index and your trading is thus independent of price movements, 
then it's random whether you'll sell, whether you'll gain or, or you'll uh, lose from insider trading. So you just need, need the law of large numbers so that profits and, and losses will equal each other out. And that's why it's diversifiable. Okay, so we end on the wisdom that sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so very true. <laughs> Good to know. So that we, have, we are 10 minutes over time, so no more questions. Unfortunately, we have a coffee break now up to 4.30. Enjoy. Thank you.